Uh, so listen, I want to uh, do a couple of things before I begin. First, I want to change the title of my talk, <laughs> but it's all related. It's all related, but it, it, it will give you an impression of what I want, to, a clearer impression of what I want to talk about tonight. So let's say the talk will be building back better, fairer, and greener. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about building back better, but, you know, building back better is not, uh, is not enough, is not sufficient. Um, so uh, we have to be clearer on what we want to do and our objectives. And by adding fairer, I'm talking about income inequality or inequalities in general, uh, which I believe is the foundation uh, of economics. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a second and also greener. Uh, I think there is no escaping um, the green, the greenery of economics now, especially with Mark Carney, uh, just released a book on it, and there'll be many more uh, to come. But um, the original title was monetary policy, fiscal policy, and green policy. Are they, um, are they in conflict? And I wanna do sort of a memento uh, a thing, I want to answer the question now and then go in reverse for the rest of the talk. And the, the clear answer is no, they're not in conflict. That, uh, you know, uh, in fact, uh, I would like to argue that the, there are two, it's a two way street, especially when it comes to, to green energy or green economics. Um, and I'll touch on that a little bit um, later in the talk. And um, so they're not in conflict. And the reason I think that they're not in conflict is for a few things. First of all, the main argument that we've heard about uh, from governments against uh, moving forward about green policies um, is because they, they've told us uh, it's costly. This is essentially the number one argument that they've used. We can't afford to adopt all these very costly programs and et cetera. Um, and this is where the conflict comes in, right? If you define conflict, it's two parties, three parties, two ideas, three ideas uh, up against uh, each other because we assume that um, the pie, is fixed. So, you know, if green policies cost more, then it leaves less uh, room for other policies. And this is where the conflict, the idea of conflict uh, in policies come from. However, uh, what this latest uh, crisis, the COVID crisis has shown us is that the assumption that the pie is fixed is wrong. That the government has the ability to not only increase the size of the pie, but determine the new size of the pie. And that there are no restrictions. For example, before COVID a year ago, uh, federal deficits were $25 billion they are now close to $400 billion. So um, where did the money come from? If, if all these policies are costly and we can't afford them, then all of a sudden overnight, and I am talking literally of overnight, uh, the, the, suddenly the government found the money for CERB and found the money for all of these COVID programs. So the theoretical argument behind austerity policies has disappeared. The idea that we cannot afford a program is no longer true. We went from 25 to $400 billion. Come on. We can afford it if we want to. So when it, what it comes down to is simply in the past when the government said, 
we can't afford, let's say, daycare, national daycare, or we can't afford green policies, or we can't afford this and that program, what they were really saying to us is we simply don't want to move forward with these policies. That's really what they were saying. Because while they were telling us on the one hand that uh, we could not afford certain policies, certain programs, on the other hand, they were reducing, let's say, um, corporate profit rates, right? And by reducing that, that, that tax rate, for example, that is a costly thing. It is the government for, uh, foregoing potential revenues. Um, so it's clearly the government was, could afford to lose those revenues. That was a decision they made. And so, um, yeah, so we, it, it's not a question of not being able to afford programs. It was a decision about not willing to have certain policies in place. Why, whatever reason, well, that's probably a perfect example of political economy and the general orientation of a, of a political party. We're not surprised that conservatives don't want green policies. Uh, a little bit more surprised if that the liberals don't want them, but nevertheless, they're, they're sort of in the middle. <clears throat> but um, for whatever reason, uh, maybe ideological reasons and, uh, and whatnot, uh, they don't want to adopt certain policies, fine. So we've gotten rid of this uh, financial or fiscal constraint. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, great. Now, what people are, what economists and, and observers are saying, they're going, yeah, okay, fine, yeah, but in the end, it's going to be, uh, it's going to lead to massive inflation. And we're talking about it now and prices are going up. Uh, you go to the, I, I go to the grocery store. Uh, I'm an avid gardener. Uh, I noticed plants this year are, are really expensive relative to next, last year. So yeah, prices are going up. I don't think they're gonna be going up permanently, but, but nevertheless, uh, they were saying the same thing in 2007, when the government uh, came out and supported um, the economy, when the central banks decided to support the economy through quantitative easing, um, and the money supply increased 20 times, people were call people were saying, people were expecting massive inflation. It didn't happen then, and it's not going to happen now. Um, you know, look, look at us, we're at $400 billion deficit and inflation is barely nudged up. It nudged up a little bit, granted, but certainly not in the scale of, you know, 15 times more deficits and inflation went from, I don't know, 1.1 to maybe 1.5, depending on which measure uh, you use, maybe 2%. So it's not a massive increase. And I don't think it's going to lead to inflation. So we've gotten rid of the fiscal constraint and I don't think there's going to be uh, any sort of inflation constraint. I don't think that's going to happen. And even the Bank of Canada is acknowledging that the inflation will be temporary. Fine. Um, so in the original title, the word conflict referred precisely to the idea of a fiscal constraint which doesn't exist. Okay, let me talk about the definition of economics. Um, so the traditional, you know, definition of the allocation of scarce resources, et cetera, et cetera. The traditional definition or the traditional view of economics is to say, um, you know, we, we have markets, and the markets know best. And if we don't interrupt the making, the working of a market, uh, we, uh, we will gravitate towards a full employment and a pleasant. I don't agree with that, uh, with that uh, definition of economics. My definition of economics is this. You must first decide, agree on what kind of society you want to live in. 
if you want a society where uh, university is $50,000 a year, where you pay uh, less taxes, where you have no Medicare, where you have no uh, uh, national daycare, great. If that's the kind of society you want, great. Move to, do, move to the United States and be happy with that. My view of economics is let's agree on the kind of society we want. We want to live in a society where uh, people have good jobs, uh, there is li there's little unemployment, um, we have an abundance of green energy, we have national daycare, uh, we have maybe national pharmacare, we have a national health system. Let's agree on the kind of society we want. And then let's figure out what we can do to pay for those programs. Um, so, you know, it might be, and maybe we want a society with less inequality. Now, undoubtedly, these things cost money. Undoubtedly. But we have to figure out as economists, as policymakers, what do we have to do here? Well, you know what? There was a time in, in, in Canada where the marginal tax rate on very high income was 75%. Now, that same period uh, corresponds to uh, what we call the golden years of capitalism, uh, lower unemployment, higher growth rates, right? So high, high tax rates don't necessarily impede economic growth. Um, so maybe we need, you know, higher, uh, higher corporate taxes. Maybe we need uh, financial asset uh, uh, transaction tax uh, on financial markets. Maybe we need, so we have to figure out what we need. And, uh, and then we, we make it happen. Maybe we need to keep interest rates low on a permanent basis. I'll get to that in a second. Maybe, you know, undoubtedly the, this period of low interest rates has helped fiscal, uh, fiscal deficits, um, absolutely. So why not look into that as a permanent solution? Anyways, um, for me, that's economics. Let's agree on what we want as a society, the type of society we want to live in. Then oh, let's make it happen. That's all. And it really is that simple. Once you have uh, understand that uh, politics, economics is about what governments want to pursue, not what they can pursue, what they want to pursue, uh, anything becomes possible. Okay, let me talk about how can we make this possible. First, let me talk to you about monetary policy. Central banks, interest rates. Okay. Um, so central banks set interest rates. Let me be clear, central banks can have any rate of interest they want. If tomorrow morning they want interest rates at 10%, no problem. If tomorrow morning they want interest rates at 0%, no problem. And we know that. We know that uh, for the past year, it, well, for the past year, yes, interest rates have been near zero. After the financial crisis, central banks, Bank of Canada lowered interest rate to near zero like that overnight. So uh, central banks can have any rate of interest it wants. And this is something that comes uh, from uh, John Maynard Keynes, see what would Keynes do? Um, uh, in, in 1946, uh, a speech he made in the House of Lords. But central banks don't have any rates of interest it wants. And central banks can leave rates wherever they want. Now, there could be consequences, repercussions. If you raise your interest rate to 10%, I guarantee you there'll be repercussions. And we know that keeping interest rates very low near zero has repercussions. We have had asset inflation uh, at an incredible rate. Financial markets have recuperated uh, to pre-COVID levels after I think nine months or 10 months after the crisis. 
right? Wages, unemployment rates, it's gonna take years for them to go back to pre-COVID levels. But, um, so we know there are consequences to low interest rates. Now, I'll get to that in just, in just a second. Um, but there's nothing stops the Bank of Canada from leaving interest rates at 0%, or at 0.25% for the next 20 years. Japan has done that. Yeah. So it's not impossible. But we need to understand that there may be consequences. If there are consequences, um, then we deal with them. So low interest rates have led to asset, uh, asset inflation, uh, inflation financial markets, and uh, which means that it has increased inequality. Uh, it has in increased inequality in terms of gender, in terms of uh, race, uh, you know, it is generally white men that have access to financial assets, who invest them in stock markets, and it's basically white men that have benefited from uh, the increase in uh, financial. Excuse me, one moment. Who have increased uh, in uh, their value financial uh, assets? Women. Uh, people of color have generally not benefited from the recent upswing uh, in uh, financial asset values. Okay, well, if that's one of the repercussions of a zero interest rate policy, well, then let's talk about that. Maybe we need uh, more regulations on financial markets. Maybe we need more regulations. Maybe we need some sort of transaction tax. Right. Um, I'm not saying that we have to completely uh, halt financial transactions on, on markets, but what I'm saying is if you are privileged and you are a, um, gaining from, from financial activities, well, maybe you could pay a tax. It could be a value tax, it could be a transaction tax, whatever you want. But we could talk about that. Uh, now, these things used to exist. We just deregulated financial markets over the last 30, 40 years. And what has happened as a result, you've had this sort of uh, huge increase in, in inequality. The big term now, the big expression, the trendy expression now is the K recovery, right? If you think of the letter K, you have a K and then it splits off. And you've had the upper part of the K letter uh, being uh, profits or financial profits or financial gains. And the lower part being wages that have stagnated, that have declined, uh, however you want to talk about the wage share, whatever you want to. But it's a K recovery. Um, and it's also not only a K recovery, but it is a white male recovery. Women are left behind. There's now talks about uh, how COVID has devastated uh, uh, female uh, participation in the labor markets. And even worse for uh, people of color and racialized minorities. So we have to think about, and it goes back to my definition of, of economics. What kind of society do you want to live in? Is this an acceptable development? Well, these are questions we need to decide collectively through political action, right? I doubt the conservatives will be elected on a platform of uh, improving labor market conditions for white and racialized minorities. I'm going out on a limb here, but I'm guessing they're not gonna do that. Okay, so, um, so that's sort of a, a monetary policy. Uh, nothing stops the central bank from keeping interest rates uh, very, very low, uh, near zero, and then dealing with the consequences of that. Okay. Um, that's one thing. Uh, also, one of the, uh, the, the way I also view uh, monetary policy, and I just, I gave, I just gave a paper at the Central Bank of Argentina uh, called a primer on monetary policy and income distribution. 
and this is sort of a big area of, of developing uh, area for me in, uh, in my research. Well, you know, uh, monetary policy is linked to income inequality. Like I just explained, if you keep interest rates low, it will lead to asset inflation. So you have to deal with that. But there's another channel that the rate of interest itself is a return on assets, on bonds. Uh, if you own bonds, and it's what we call rentiers, because they make their income through rents, through the rates of returns on bonds. When interest rates go up, the, the, fact, the, the mere fact of owning a bond leads to an increased revenue. And so when interest rates are pushed up, bondholders are making more money and workers are making less money. So it's, you know, there's a Canadian economist here called John Smithen, uh, emeritus at York, who called his, 19, uh, his 1994 book, The Revenge of the Rentier. Uh, as a, you know, uh, when interest rates went very high, it was really a, a bonus for asset holders. And then we can talk to, about who owns those assets. It's white men and fine. But, um, but we have to understand that uh, monetary policy is not just about uh, regulating economic activity. To be honest, I don't think monetary policy is that effective um, in regulating. Lawrence Summers, uh, if you know the name, Lawrence Summers I wrote a paper last year call, call, uh, and called um, talking about the, uh, the impotence of monetary policy. And the, I, I think it's right. I mean, monetary policy at low rates doesn't do anything for the economy and at very high rates completely destroys it. So we have to rethink our general view of monetary policy. We have to rethink uh, how interest rates are used. We have to uh, rethink um, uh, our whole approach to monetary policy. And if we keep interest rates low, which is preferable, um, then we have to deal with the consequences of monetary policy. Now, everything I have to say tonight is completely against free markets. <laughs> like free market means don't do anything. I'm saying, no, 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 no. Pile up the regulations. That's what I'm saying. Okay, that's monetary policy, rethinking monetary policy. Uh, then, um, oh, by the way, for those interested, I did edit a book a few years ago called Rethinking Economics. Um, and there's books about what I just said about monetary policy and central banks in there. But there's Rethinking Economics about, you know, uh, international trade and rethinking the environment and rethinking energy and rethinking. Anyways, uh, it's in paperback. If, if, you know. um, so that's monetary policy. Well, let's talk about fiscal policy. As I said, there is no fiscal constraint. And if there are consequences to fiscal policy, then we have to deal with it as well, right? It's a question of dealing with the implications of having large deficits. Um, now, if you have large deficits, you kind of have to have low interest rates because then you're going to get into a trap of not being, you know, imagine if you own money on your credit cards at 19%. Imagine if you own money on your credit cards and the credit card um, is, uh, the credit card rate is 1%. It's very different. Um, it's very different. And like I said at the beginning, figure out the society in which you'll want to live in, then figure out how you're going to achieve that. Well, you achieve that by low interest rate policy and you deal with some consequences. And you also deal uh, with fiscal policy. Now under, fiscal, now, under monetary policy, there is a lot of, uh, I'm coming out with a book soon on uh, monetary policy and the environment. And that's becoming a very interesting area of research 
what can central banks do? Now, one of the consequences of low interest rates, it is argued, is that it encourages um, high carbon footprint. Well, then you deal with it. You just deal with it. Uh, you impose regulations. And you know, the 1950s and 60s were full of regulations and the economy worked. So we shouldn't be afraid of regulations. Those who don't want regulations are people who are clearly gaining on the backs of others. Right? Um, regulations are only about leveling the playing field. And for some reason that scares people. But in terms of fiscal policy, then you can get into uh, green investment by the creation of a green public bank. Uh, in, at the ECB, for example, the European Central Bank is lending directly to, uh, um, is encouraging banks to lend for green projects at a negative interest rate. Again, you, you, you figure out how you want to achieve what you want to achieve low interest rate loans for green energy? Yeah, maybe. You can have different interest rates for different degrees of green policies. And the examples of green projects is limitless. We can sit here and we can talk about all sorts of policies. And you know, uh, we could encourage, you know, uh, homeowners and private sector firms all going green. I drove once, I was driving from Grenoble in France and I was going to Vienna. And uh, I decided to drive because I wanted to go to uh, uh, the Bavarian Alps. And what I noticed is that every single home, and I'm not kidding you, every single home had um, solar energy on their rooftops. And uh, I, I inquired about that and the government basically gave them huge subsidies. Again, costly, but is this the type of policies that we want? If it is, then make it happen. And that was a good, and that's a good example. So um, it's been about 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to stop there uh, and I'll be happy to uh, continue uh, the discussion through questions um, and more. Thank so thank you, uh, Louis Philippe. Uh, before I launch into the questions in the chat box, uh, and let me say to everybody, please um, ask questions into the chat box if you have any questions. Um, Louis Philippe, I'd like to ask, if you were grading the general public on economics, um, would you give them a, a B plus or a D minus? And in terms of the kind of society we want to live in, we seem to have been sold uh, on a society of being rich. Of course, only a very few people are rich and it's fewer and fewer, but we seem to have uh, accepted this idea that the kind of society we want to live in is that we could be rich, although we're not, uh, individually. Um, where did that come from and how can we push back and wh why is it so difficult to change our paradigm about what is a fair economy? Mm. Uh, I'll give you some anecdotes. First of all, how do I rate the public uh, badly? Look, when I take a taxi, when I uh, um, uh, meet people uh, and um, they say things to me, you know, in the taxi or the guy who cuts my hair and yeah, I do get my hair. <laughs> um, but the, at the barbers, but funny enough, we have conversations and they say things like, oh my God, this deficit is gonna create huge inflation. And I'm always wondering, these people are not, don't have economics degrees but yet they have this predisposed idea about economics. 
And it's just basically, you know, I remember Dan Mazankowski. I'm sure you remember him as well. When he was Minister of Finance and he got up in the House of Commons and I thought this was brilliant. He took out his credit card and he says, can you live uh, with your credit card maxed out? And he raised it in the House of Commons and visually uh, and everything, it was, it was, it was one, I disagree, but it was wonderful. And there's this, and I think that's one of the, 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 the best successes of uh, the right uh, to convince people that the state uh, is faced with the same sort of constraints that you have. So it's what we call the microeconomic view of the state. And yeah, I can't live with my credit card maxed out. Not at tw not a 19% interest rate. And yes, I'll get into financial trouble. Uh, but not the state. The state is very different. The state, uh, we've just seen the state uh, uh, exploding in debt. And now the prognosis is that the deficit will start coming, that will be cut by half by next year, you know. Uh, the government can always increase its own salary income, you know, uh, which I can't. Um, so there's a whole reasons why we should not uh, see the state uh, from a microeconomic perspective. But you know, a lot of people believe that. And a lot of people just repeat same old arguments. Um, regarding um, the view, uh, how do we change paradigm? I remember when I was living in the United States, I remember telling my neighbors, um, yeah, maybe we should increase taxes a little bit on the rich. Uh, and you go, and, and, and he was saying, no, and he was like a plumber. And he was saying, no, no, we should not increase taxes on the rich. And I go, why, why are you so against it? Because I may become rich one day <laughs> and I don't want to pay high taxes at that time. And it's sort of this, especially in the United States, this idea that you can uh, socially move up um, the American dream. Uh, and that's a very much embedded. And I think in a lot of people as well, I think in Canada, it's a little bit better. I think in Canada, we do. Um, and I think, and, and um, COVID polls have shown this, where Canadians seem to be uh, very much aware of inequality um, and the consequences, the in inequality consequences of COVID and how it has, it has touched certain communities more. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I, I have more faith in Canadians. Um, you know, after all, we didn't elect a Donald Trump yet, but um, <laughs> but I think I have more faith in Canadians in maybe seeing things a little bit better. And I think things are changing a little bit. And I'll tell you why uh, in 2007, people, economists, we, we were saying, oh, this is it, this is it, this is the big change. And it didn't happen. Things went back to normal. We go back to conferences in 2009 and economists were giving papers as if the, 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 the crisis never happened. But this crisis is different. This crisis is different because it virtually touched everybody. Everybody received CERB or a sibling or a parent received CERB. Everybody had to stay home. Everybody had to quarantine and, and et cetera. So I think people are very aware of uh, what happened during this crisis and especially on inequality. I told my, I asked my students all the time, who received CERB or had, you know, their 20 or had their parents received CERB? Every single one, every single student, you know. And I said, imagine what would have happened if your parent did not receive CERB. And that also changes, I think, the perception that people have about what the state can do. Um, and I think this is where the conservatives are missing and uh, or uh, mis misreading. Everybody in Canada appreciates, and we see that poll after poll, um, and that may change. But for now, we see that Canadians are saying, wow, the government can do good. Um, you know, and, and uh, yeah, so I think 
in Canada, we might be a little bit more uh, open to a change in paradigm, but we've, you know, we, we got to work at it for sure. So part of that paradigm, I've got a question here in the chat box about guaranteed minimum income. So to be, you know, very practical, what are your views on guaranteed minimum income? It, it, you know, some would say it's a natural extension of SERB. Others would say no, because it's, uh, it's, it, 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 it's, it's given to everybody. But, but so what are your views, Louis Philippe? Should that be part of uh, policy me, going forward? Let me, uh, let me be controversial and blurt out I don't like a minimum guaranteed income. Okay, so that's my uh, controversial statement, but let me explain that. Um, I think <laughs> I would much rather the government create jobs. Minimum guaranteed income will give Canadians $15,000 a year, something like that. A job gives much more. And I think that if we adopt a minimum guaranteed income, it will, uh, let governments off the hook for job creation. We need to have a full employment policy. Um, uh, now, I think uh, minimum guaranteed income is great for those who are chronically cannot get a job for whatever reason. But overall, I say, look, let's go out and create jobs. Look, we, we don't hear governments talking about full employment anymore. Governments don't talk about full employment. Governments barely talk about job creation. And when they talk about job creation, it's about making, you know, um, uh, enabling the private sector to create jobs. You know, um, we have to see, we have to see the government as a job creator. And I would much rather go down that route now Minimum guaranteed income as a second best solution, fine. Um, but I would much rather concentrate on creating jobs. Creating green so, jobs. I've got a com Yeah, and let I've me got just a comment here. For yeah. yeah, sure, sure. I just want to talk about um, about uh, the no growth. Uh, no, I'm not a big fan of no growth, of degrowth, uh, decolonization, all those policies. Um, look, I understand the argument. And um, uh, and again, it's it's a question of, you know, regu I, I would rather have growth which raises incomes and wages and productivity, and then deal with if there are environmental uh, consequences to growth, you deal with it. You deal with regulations. So I have a comment here um, that I'll bounce off you. So let me read it. Might we look at programs? Um, that we would like to have in society and think what activities would we like to, what we have to undertake to make those things happen rather than uh, how can we find the money to do them? And the point is about escaping the value of uh, the, 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 the need to monetize the real things of life. The, the abstraction of money carries the danger of alienating us from the creative work and environmental impacts of our activities. Uh, does that resonate with you that we, we, should, we should start thinking about in, in terms of society, the activities we would like rather than the, the, the money it costs? <clears throat> That's sort of Gene Roddenberry, uh, Roddenberry uh, utopian socialism, a vision of Star Trek. Um, um, you know, I'm open to that discussion. Um, and again, it's part of the discussion and the part of how do you value uh, what you what your objectives. Um, but at the end of the day, I do think that there needs to be a monetization or or, or a way of paying for those uh, services and goods. Uh, but you know, I'm open to to a discussion of other forms. Uh, and there, you know, there's an emerging um, there's an emerging uh, literature on um, new forms of capitalism, if you Google that. Um, and there's, you know, people who are saying, you know, maybe we could do this differently. Um, and, uh, and I'm open to, 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 to that 
uh, dialogue, um, but I haven't given it much thought in, 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 that, in, 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 in that sense. There's quite a, um, a lot of people who remember the role of the Bank of Canada in, in Canada's history and how effective it was in financing uh, major projects. Um, so I've got a question here. Can the Bank of Canada implement policies that will aid in the transition off fossil fuels and into sustainable green energy alternatives? And can you unravel that a little bit? Because what is the Bank of Canada? Is it, isn't that just government policy rather than Bank of Canada policy, given that Bank of Canada only really sets interest rates. So how do you unravel this idea that, you know, things were great when the Bank of Canada was financing stuff and it's not great now that we have uh, private sector investment? Yeah, look, um, <clears throat> you know, again, uh, the Bank of Canada, uh, can be mandated to do other things. Uh, we think of the Bank of Canada in terms of interest rate policy, and that's certainly a very real and a large component of what they do. Um, but when those interest rates went down to zero, the Bank of Canada and other central banks were essentially pushed into a corner and they didn't know what else to do. And so that's when they came up with uh, concepts like uh, 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 quantitative easing, or uh, concepts like negative interest rates. Um, and so the Bank of Canada can, for example, uh, lend directly to, uh, to, co to corporations um, to encourage uh, green energy, like you mentioned. The Federal Reserve has done that. Um, um, so uh, yeah, the Bank of Canada can do whatever, can do other things than setting interest rates. And they can do it quite well. A lot of people are, are pushing for uh, green quantitative easing. Um, there is such a thing as green interest rates. So you would give um, lower interest rates to corporations who invest in green energy and higher interest rates for companies in fossil fuels, for example. Or uh, the Bank of Canada in their quantitative easing would purchase um, assets from greener companies. Um, so there's a number. The interesting thing is, is that um, there's a lot of research going on uh, in central banking. And uh, I'm currently editing 10 books on central banking. And it's about pushing the boundaries of how we see central banks. And uh, the series will deal with central banking, monetary policy, and gender, and, and, and the environment, and democracy, you know, um, uh, and, you know, deal with uh, um, development, um, think about the other titles. So, we're, you know, there's a lot of research being done on what more can central banks do, because we realize that just having interest rates is not enough central banks could do a little bit more. What is that? How can they do it more? And there's a lot of literature now on central bank and uh, green energy. It's a booming area of research. Like I said, Mark Carney is, is making that his pet project, but there's a lot of- so, Yeah. So I've got, another I've got another question here um, and it relates to banks, not central banks, but private sector banks. So it, the question is, how could we overcome the resistance of banks to change monetary policy? Now, again, this is convoluted because you've said that if monetary policy is just about changing interest rates, well, the only way, the thing you can do right now is increase them and that would provide more income to bondholders and rentiers in general, which is probably not a good thing to do. But where do you see the role of private sector banks in all of this? You talked about bank regulation. What, what kind, of, you know, if, if you were in charge of government policy, what bank regulations would you like to introduce tomorrow? <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of bank regulations. You know, people borrow money in order to, to, to invest in the financial markets. We can, you know, definitely regulate that. But, you know, I think banks are, and you know, may not make friends here by saying this, but I don't think banks are the villain here. You know, banks are doing what banks do. Um, if you want to do more, 
Uh, yes, you could regulate or you could create public banks, uh, banks run by the government. And you could have a green public bank. You could have a gender public bank, a public bank that, inv that lends to women um, uh, for you know whatever project, but it encourages uh, uh, women entrepreneurs. You could have a green bank. You could have all sorts of uh, different types of uh, public banks, uh, and you could definitely regulate certain behavior. Uh, you know, banks. Uh, we we did have the problems in Canada with subprime markets uh, lending, as they did in the United States. Uh, I know that uh, some people think that we did a little bit, but nevertheless, if we did, it certainly wasn't at, on the scale of what they did in the United States. Uh, you can uh, regulate predatory lending. Uh, you know, in the United States, they were targeting uh, black communities. Uh, they were targeting uh, poor communities. They were targeting. So you can certainly regulate outlaw predatory lending. And you can do all sorts of stuff. I am a firm believer that you can do whatever you want. It's just you have to, 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 to sit down and want to, to do these things. And in the end, yeah, you, you, you're going to have a regulated economy. But there's nothing wrong with having regulated economy. And I'll tell you one thing. We know now, some of us always knew, but we know now that free markets don't work. They don't work. And uh, they lead to huge inequalities. They lead to financial crises. Um, and uh, uh, they don't work. So we got to eliminate that um, as, um, as something to strive for. And we know that regulations go a long way and did during the 40s, 50s, 60s, and part of the 70s, the golden years, in leading to you know to to higher wages, higher wage share, higher growth, etc. So you know it's a question of willing willingness. So I've got a comment here, a question, and it kind of covers ground we've already covered, but it's important. So let me ask, let me read it out. Could you comment on the change in the Swedish economy from a socialist economy uh, to one that now emphasizes austerity and requiring the government to remain debt free. So, he, so you know, the question you pose, let's have a discussion among all the parties, conserv conservatives, liberal, NDP and Greens about what kind of society we'd like to have and then talk about ways we'd like to get there. Instead, we in, in Sweden, they seem to have done what other countries have done, the UK has done it too, they go back to austerity. Uh, so is this like an international conspiracy, Louis-Philippe, or is this, is this something that's stuck in our heads that we just can't get out of the idea that governments can't be debt free? No, it's, 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 it's again this microeconomic perception of the state. We know that austerity is a failure. We know that we've got, look, everything in economics is an empirical question. If I say to you, economic growth is good, right? Going back to the question of no growth. If I say economic growth is good, that's an empirical question. You have to go out, get the data and show that. We know that austerity doesn't work. We know that austerity has made things worse. We have the empirical data for that. Um, so austerity is not an economic question. Austerity is a political question and it's an ideological question. And uh, when you elect governments that are on the right of the political spectrum, um, and, and some people on the right got that, you know, when Angela Merkel comes out in favor of government spending, when the IMF trashes austerity, um, you know, things are changing. Uh, and we are recognizing that austerity, uh, you know, the World Bank came out with, you know, can't remember the title of it, but it was something like, you know, austerity is bad, you know. So we have the empirical evidence to support that. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people will disregard the evidence and will simply go forward with the austerity message. And like I said, 
they sell it on the idea that you and I cannot be, uh, cannot live beyond our means, so neither can the state. Um, and people buy it. It's a great argument. We just have to be able to break that argument. And it's easy to break the argument. You know? So I happen to stumble through <laughs> Piketty's book, who ends up with suggesting a wealth tax. Do you agree with, uh, given inequality, do you agree with wealth taxes? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and um, not only do I believe in a wealth tax, um, absolutely. But I also believe um, in uh, uh, inheritance taxes. Uh, you know, uh, these families that propagate wealth from one generation to the other. Um, and, you know, to be fair, let's remind ourselves that we are talking about people who have massive wealth. Um, there's a great economist uh, called Mariana Maducato. And she wrote a, a wonderful book uh, maybe 10 years ago, and I recommend you buy it. Um, and uh, she's, since then, she's been advising every government on, on, on the planet. Funny enough, I did my PhD with her um, and at the new school, and but she's now in, and uh, it's an incredible book. And what she has shown is, that um, there has been a lot, that all of these private sector or all of these people who have made immense uh, uh, amounts of wealth often comes from sectors that were uh, hugely financed by government. Uh, pharmaceuticals is one of those sectors. Massive tax breaks for research. So they've got, they've private, the internet, you know, uh, Amazon would not have existed had it not been for government uh, research into the creation of something called the internet. So they have privatized the profits, but socialized the risks. And that the, she, she's advocating for uh, some sort of internet tax. All these companies making lots of money off the internet, which was government funded through taxes, through our taxes. And so again, privatize the profits of a few people and uh, socialize the risk through tax growth subsidies. So I've got a question here about taxes, which is interesting. Um, what do you think about, uh, on, it says a poll tax, I think he means a value added tax on everything versus income tax that can easily be manipulated. So, I mean, I know, MMT thinking is that you spend the money and tax it back uh, afterwards. You don't you don't wait to find the money before you implement a policy. But look, given that we have to tax, should we be taxing? And we talked about a wealth tax. Should we be taxing income? Should we be taxing financial income rather than real income? Should it be taxing wealth, which we've just discussed? Um, should it be value added tax, which is easy to, to collect? Sh should companies be, and like, where do we get our taxes from, especially um, given the MMT thinking that you tax to control inflation? Actually taxing is something that you should do in the economy to stop imbalances happening rather than to fund things. So what would be your preferred mix of taxes? So, you know, the MMT people, uh, these are all my friends, uh, and uh, I used to be very critical, but, but you know, I've come to appreciate a lot of what they, they've written. Um, and I think they got it right on a number of, of things and less right on other things. But again, it's part of a dialogue. Um, when it comes to taxes, uh, you know, yeah, I'm a big fan of taxes. Uh, and, for me, taxes is foremost about regulating inequality. I mentioned marginal tax rate of 70, 75%, wealth taxes, transaction taxes, financial transaction taxes. All of these, I think um, the objective should be about reducing inequality, um, which has gotten, because, 
the level of inequality, Piketty, you mentioned Piketty. Piketty has a great graph um, where he shows that the level of inequality in 1929, right before the crash, was at the same level as right before the 2007 crash. And for me, that makes sense because uh, I, I explained to my students, for me, uh, uh, inequality is the foundation of a house. And if that foundation is very strong, meaning less inequality, is very strong, you can build a great house on that. But if your foundation is weak, your house will eventually collapse. And that's what happened in 1929. That's what happened in 2007. And for the record, I'm creating a class at Laurentian called the History of Financial Crises. And, and a large focus of that class will be on, on inequality. You need, to, you need to regulate inequality. You need to reduce inequality if you want to have a sustainable uh, economy in the long run. Taxes are about money, and um, let me mention Steve Keen's name. One of the things he's advocating now is carbon rations. In other words, uh, not pricing carbon, but rationing it. So you'd have a ration card, and uh, everybody would get the same ration, and people that used a lot of carbon would have to buy their carbon carbon rations from people who didn't use a lot of carbon. So do you think, we, given the climate change climate crisis we're going to have to go to a rationing system rather than a, a, a monetary taxation system so what steve is is uh, you know i've known steve for god 25 years and what steve is proposing so most uh solutions uh to to the to 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 energy to carbon is a price-based solution and for economists like Steve and myself, um, these often don't, or tax, right, or don't work properly. What we, what you have to do is operate directly on output, on the quantity. And so, in that sense, a ration for me makes a lot of sense. Absolutely, I think Steve has it right. I've got a question here. Could you? Um... Uh, give us, I mean, and we can do this afterwards by email, but there's a question for the title of your book. Um, so if you could uh, send it to me by email, we'll we'll put it out in the notes on the on the which, meeting. Which book? This is the one you showed, I think, the one that you... Um, this one here? The, the, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link and um, there's an e-version that's, that's not too expensive. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of, um, I, I, I want to do a second edition of this book, um, but there's a lot of book about, uh, in the book about rethinking uh, exchanges and prices, there you go, but rethinking money, rethinking growth, rethinking distribution, rethinking, you know, et cetera. So it's, uh, it's a good little book. Well, thick book, but I'll, I'll see you look. One of the things I've, I've learned tonight, listening to you, Louis Philippe, I didn't realize the impact on women and um, poor people and indigenous people um, because of COVID. Um, it, and that doesn't seem to have hit papers, or maybe I'm just not reading the correct papers, but uh, you know, as it was a federal election coming up, and I don't see it on the radar screen as being, what do we do about people who've really lost out? I mean, some people have benefited. Uh, people yeah. who got still were paid, were living at, were working from home. But, you know, as you point out, a, a vast number of people have been severely hurt by COVID. So um, am I missing something? Is this part of the discussion? There has been a couple of uh, pieces in the Star and the Globe and Mail on how COVID has uh, affected um, uh, different groups differently. There is talk about a, uh, not a recovery, but a she-covery uh, because it has impacted women uh, disproportionately. And, you know, one of these things about uh, racialized minorities is often uh, their lifestyle is very different. They tend to live um, uh, in apartments with, you know, more siblings and parents together. 
And when one person gets sick, everybody got sick. And but you know, this is about inequality, isn't it? About um, how you know inequality of incomes and they're forced to to to, to live more together, etc. So yeah, there has been a few. If you Google um, COVID and inequality, you'll you'll find uh, stuff. Now, is it on the radar of some political parties? But that's a different question altogether. And again, it goes back to, you know, uh, governments, are they willing or not to deal with these issues? I can mention, you know, nothing could be simpler to, 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 um, to fix than the issue of uh, contaminated water on indigenous uh, land. Why, why is this so complicated to fix? Again, it's, I think it's a question. The government's not really willing to fix it. I hope the Green Party will. And I think that, you know, there's a lot. I, I think this crisis really has, uh, has changed people's empathy. I do think so. Uh, people have realized that this was a difficult crisis. And uh, I hope that the Green Party will, will take this to heart and talk about the humanity of the crisis or the lack of humanity of, of these crises and how you know, we have to do things better, fairer, and greener. Um, I don't... I've just got a final question. And again, it bears on what we've just talked about, but it's from a woman who's listening and it says that, you know, sorry, I think men are generally unaware of their white or white men, of their white privilege. Um, and it's a man's world and only a few men seem to notice this uh, and, and their privilege over women. And I'm sure if you were indigenous, you'd feel the same thing. Um, so, you know, part of the, it's, it's, I'm, I'm being unfair to you because we, this is a, an economics discussion, not a, not a sociology discussion, but, you know, it, it goes to show that just as we are fixated about government debt, we're also, it's hard for us to get out of our um, paradigms about who we are and how privileged we are and recognize that privilege. Um, is that something that you think economics can help us with? It's a good question. I'm not sure how I uh, would answer that. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I mean, uh, people do try to change things, you know, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole, uh, ah, my God, the whole uh, Occupy uh, Wall Street movement. Um, it just didn't resonate enough. But, but I'm pretty confident that this crisis has done something more. I mean, unfortunately, it's, it's sort of a silver lining thing. Uh, but I'm not sure how to answer your question. I'm, I'm sorry. I put the link no, to my it's book. A, it's a fair book, answer. By the way. Actually, there's, a, so there's some questions in the chat box about also the title of the book that you mentioned about um, somebody who, uh, I'm, I'm looking for the question, somebody who, a woman who had written about, um, uh, I'm looking for it now. By Mariana, anyway, you, Mariana yes, correct. So um, I'm going to, uh, uh, Her book was called, I'm going to put a link in the, uh, now she's a wonderful, oh, well, you know, uh, okay. So I'm going to put the link there to her book. Okay, so if you're going to buy a book, buy this one before you buy mine. You're going to learn a lot more uh, from that uh, book. And um, I'm going to uh, put a link to a TED talk that she gave um that it's only 14 minutes but i'm telling you my students uh were blown away every time i show it 
uh, I show her, I show them this, uh, this talk. But uh, yeah, by, by the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial state. And what Mariana does, you know, she says, look, the iPhone wouldn't exist if it was not for government funding. You know, it's just someone in their basement has put different components together and made the iPhone. But every component of the iPhone is government funds, government research. Um, it's a fantastic book. Start with the TED Talk, then go and buy the book. It's phenomenal. So look, a last question. Um, are you winning? I mean, if, you, if I, I'm, I'm not an economist, I follow certain economists, um, but I know the, the, the criticism is that economists, the, the, the economics profession will never change. It is completely stuck in old uh, paradigms and it's hard for new people to, um, new ideas to be accepted. So do you think the economics profession is, is changing? The, 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 the change that you talk about through COVID that people have been affected, do you think it's hit the economics profession and they're ready to, to uh, to change some of their uh, set in stone ideas. You know, Joan Robinson, who's this great economist, woman economist, uh, she had a great expression saying, you learn economics in order not to be fooled by economists. Um, and yeah, no, you're right. The economics profession is notorious, notoriously. I think it's because they just don't know any better. Um, you know, uh, again, Joan Robinson says, you know, you go to school for some 10 years and in order to get your degree, you have to write a dissertation on, you know, on certain topics and certain methodology. And then you get your degree. And then in order to get a job, you got to prove, you got to do research using that methodology. And then by the time you have a job, then you have to get tenured. And then you have to get tenure based on publications <laughs> in that methodology. And by the time uh, you're old enough, you realize you, you know nothing about and you've been doing research using <laughs> that methodology for 20 years. Um, and I think that uh, that's largely true. And, uh, but things are slowly changing, you know. Um, mind you, I've been told for 25 years that things are changing but they haven't changed that much. <laughs> um, but there are, you know, there are little signs of change here and there that are encouraging. Uh, I, I think the French expression is, le plus ça change, le plus c'est la même chose. And so maybe on that note, well, I can on, handle- let me, you, let me just give you a little uh, uh, um, story <laughs> that I think is so funny. I was invited by the Central Bank of Kyrgyzstan of all places. So I gave a talk there about four, three or four years ago. And it was me at this head table. And uh, next to me was the president of the central bank. And they invited me to come and talk to them about inflation targeting, which they wanted to adopt. And I don't know why they invited me because nothing in my paper says I'm in favor of it. But I was talking about <laughs> critical about inflation targeting, you know, uh, you know, in an economy, that's 85% uh, black market. What the hell is the inflation rate about? Anyways, so 10 minutes into my talk, the governor of the central bank gets up and leaves. Now he was, he was sitting right next to me. He just leaves. That's like <laughs> slap in the face. And then during the questions, uh, the chief economist, the chief econometrician, et cetera, it was open season on Roshan. And then the IMF, the woman, the, the, rep, the IMF representative to Kyrgyzstan gets up and says, I agree with everything Roshan says. And the punchline is, I don't know what was more embarrassing, having the governor uh, leave during my talk or having the IMF agree with me. Um, but there is signs that the IMF is changing a little bit there. They've come out against austerity, the World Bank, you see critical economists being in, uh, hired at the World Bank, hired at the Banque de France, hired at the Bank of England. Um, so, you know, this was not possible 10 years ago. So there are small encouraging signs. Who knows what will happen, but. 
I think encouraging is a good word to to end on, Louis Philippe. So thank you. And I, let me pass this back to Laurie to to uh, to to close. Well, thank you so much, uh, Louis Philippe. That was uh, amazing. I uh, really Glad you liked it. it. I, I feel like I learned a lot, and I have some good reading lined up now, <laughs> and some TED talks as well. Um, so we do really appreciate you sharing. Uh, your knowledge with us and uh, and giving us an I some ideas of other ways that we can change and uh, using economics to push forward a green agenda and a more uh, equitable uh, society going forward. We really, really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you so and much. Thank you. And let me just end with saying, if anybody tells you, oh, we can't afford that, please just dismiss them. Uh, uh, because I think if the one thing you, you, you can take away from this is the idea that we cannot afford is just not true. Not true. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you very much. I look forward to meeting okay. you in person one day. Yes, that'd be lovely. Thank you. You're Thanks welcome. So much. Bye bye. Okay. Bonsoir tout le monde. Uh, just quickly for those left on, we will send out um, an email with some of those links uh, afterwards, as well as the link for the recording. And I will stop recording now. Maybe. Very well done.